Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. This is Georgia Stanley and I'm the manager of membership and communications for the BC Association of Farmers Markets. We are a nonprofit that works to support, promote and develop farmers markets across the province. And welcome to our webinar, Merch Merchandising and Displays, Building a Great Farmers Market Booth. We have about 70 people joining us so far on the webinar this morning from all across the province. And we're so happy to have Michelle Wolf joining us to lead the webinar today all the way from Nova Scotia. So before I introduce Michelle, I'll go over a few reminders. This is the second of three free webinars the BCAFM is offering this winter on marketing for farmers market vendors and farmers market marketers. The next webinar is coming up February 19th. And the topic of that will be best practices in social media for farmers markets and vendors working together to leverage your online presence with social media consultant and trainer Rebecca Coleman. And we're really grateful to be able to offer these webinars thanks to the support of the Van City Enviro Fund. The webinar will be recorded today so we can post it online at a later date and we will email you a link to the recording soon, probably today or tomorrow, so you can watch it again or share it. And at the end of the webinar today, there will be an opportunity to ask Michelle any remaining questions that you have. We'll ask you to type these into the question section in your GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on the right of your screen. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Michelle Wolf, who will be your facilitator today. Michelle is widely recognized as one of Canada's leading farmers market experts. She's from Kamloops, BC, and now lives in Nova Scotia, where she's the lead facilitator and program developer for very successful farmers market vendor and management training programs. She's a former award-winning farmers market manager, an 18-year veteran farmers market vendor, and sat on the founding board of Farmers Markets Canada. Michelle teaches and trains across Canada. She has a background in board governance, community development, and adult education, and currently runs a consulting and training company, Whole Green Heart, which you can learn more about at wholegreenheart.com. Thank you and welcome, Michelle. Great, thank you so much, Georgia. I'm just gonna get my um, mic going here and my webcam. Just let us know if at any point during the presentation you aren't able to either see the webcam or um, if you can see my control panel, because we don't want that. And uh, without further ado, thank you all for being here today. So the good, the great, and the not so great of farmers market merchandising and displays. That's essentially what I'm going to be presenting today through a bunch of visuals. This is a webinar of photographs, getting you thinking about your own displays by looking at a whole bunch of other displays by other vendors across North America. Um, I do want to say just something quick about online learning. I know that it's very tempting to have a bunch of things going on right now on your phone and on your computer because what a great opportunity to just be sitting somewhere. Um, and so we want to get a bunch of things done. But what we know about online learning is, of course, that people retain so much more and get more out of the time spent when they're just focused on this one thing only. So close those phones and browsers if you can. Use pen and paper to take notes. We will be sending out a copy of my slides um, along with the link to the presentation. And I also provided some other resources about building a great display, tips for building uh, your booth and merchandising. So all of that's kind of coming as a kit by email to you from Anise at BCAFM um, later today or tomorrow. Um, just for any of you who weren't on the webinar last week, um, I thank Georgia for the nice introduction there. I want to reiterate that I have been involved in farmers markets since what 1993, so that's a long time now, almost an embarrassing long time, over 25 years as a manager, a vendor, and a board governance trainer. 
Now, I left full-time vending in 2013 when I sold my farm business. I didn't sell my farm, but I sold the value-added business that was my farmer's market business, my herbal and seed company. It was called Pumpkin Moon Farm. Um, and that, the re, part of the reason for that was because I was busy doing all of this work, traveling around and giving presentations. And so this body of of people that I've been working with over the years has grown and grown and grown. Many thousands of people have been at conferences or been in webinars that I've done. And so I feel like everything that I'm presenting now a days is really a collection of wisdom that I've got because of the questions and the comments and the feedback and the emails that you send me. So this webinar in particular, because it's filled with photographs, if any of you at the end have photographs of your booth that you'd like me to include in my collection of photos of farmer's market vendors, I'd be so happy to include those in subsequent versions of um, this presentation. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have pictures that you'd like to share. So last week, to recap, we went over what I call my 3P principle, and it's simply that in direct sales environments, including farmer's markets, that is where the consumer of the product is buying it directly from the person who created it or made it, that's direct marketing. Sales in those situations are not just a function of you having a groovy or a cool or a popular product. Sales are actually a function of P, your product, but also P, you as a person, and P, the presentation or merchandising of that product. And if you're interested in that presentation, I'm not sure if um, BCAFM is making that available for those of you who weren't with us last week. Um, signed up for the webinar, but that was really one of the key principles that we covered during the webinar. So in this session, we're looking specifically at that final P, the presentation part of the formula. So we looked really at sort of sales and we focused a lot on P, customer service, the person side of things last week, and this is presentation. And I'm gonna contrast some not so great with some good and some great photos to help you see your own booth through a different set of eyes. Now, I will say, um, I didn't take all of these pictures, the former executive director of Farmers Markets in Nova Scotia and the person before her, um, they both had photographs as well that we compiled together when I was first building this presentation. A lot of them are from me, but I, um, my, you know, my big fear is that at some point somebody is going to see one of the pictures that was not so great and it will be you. <laughs> and I hope that doesn't happen, but feel free to also email me and say, I wouldn't mind being taken out <laughs> of your presentation. Um, so I hope I don't put anybody on the spot here today. So what you're going to see is these title slides, the big picture, and then I'm going to show you a few slides to tell you what I mean by the big picture. So first and foremost, the big picture means how do people see your booth when they're approaching you at a distance from a farmer's market? Because I think one of the things we study is what are our customers seeing when they're standing right there in front of our booth? But think about this, every one of those people depending on where you are in a market, there will be some um, exceptions to this rule. But by and large, most of you have also been seen from far away and people have had to make their way to you. And so how do you look farther away? So this booth, you know, you might think, well, it's pretty good. You know, the tablecloths are all matching and their tents are all in a nice row. But if I contrast it with this one, you suddenly start seeing the difference tablecloths in this case are dropped all the way to the floor. So we're not seeing any bags, boxes, or clutter as we're approaching from a distance. Yes, there's the same three white tents, but look at the difference it makes when you have assigned some kind of merchandising up high. So people are not just seeing your product and you, but they get a real visual at that higher level when they're approaching your booth from across the farmer's market. So we have three tents in each case, but we get a very different feeling, a very different big picture, because in the second case, they've spent more time and money being thoughtful about how they look at both 
close up, but also at a distance. The big picture here is that plants are one of the few things, especially large perennials like this, that you probably can sell from the ground. There's not very many products that lend themselves to that. But there's no defined path here for customers to move through. So there's some beautiful perennials. I don't see tags on these. I don't see a natural flow away for people to kind of move through this display. Some pallets so that the plants are up off the ground and then you could have these little pallets where people could circle around them and be looking at the plants on the pallets and plant tags. That would do a world of good to clean up this display and the cost of a few pallets is nominal if not free. Um, so there's a lot that could be done to just move this um, the presentation up here very quickly and easily. This is a picture from the um, New York City has a set of farmers markets run by the Green City Farmers Market Initiative. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, Green City, yeah. Um, and, um, a number of years ago, I was in a community choir and we traveled to New York City for a couple of winters for Martin Luther King Jr. Day and we would sing at Lincoln Center. It was amazing and I would attend their winter farmer's market. So yes, New York City, very cold, easterly climate. Farmer's markets are year round outside. So um, to all of you who feel like that's not something that we can do in Canada, sure we can. But you notice that what this vendor has done is use the fact that they want to wrap around their whole booth with some nice um, tarps in order to keep out the wind, protect the product, protect their customers. They've used that as an opportunity to do some really great merchandising in big print. And so one of the handouts I've sent to you is actually what size text do you need to use to be read for that text to be read at different distances? So it's kind of a neat handout. And you'll get that with the materials for this webinar. Here's another one that I really like. It's very simple. You're, this is using old apple boxes, some pieces of plywood covered in bur burlap. There's nothing fancy going on here. But what have they done right? They've laid it out very linear, haven't they? We as human beings, we scan environments most of the time left to right, and we like things that are lined up. The more linear you can make your displays, the more quickly people can um, organize in their mind what they're seeing. So I like, it's almost like there's sunbeams, um, the little spokes of the wheel sort of. I like that they've put the dill right beside the cucumbers. They've got some different heights going on. They've got some, many of the bins tilted forward. Um, nothing fancy here, but a really good example of good merchandising. Work with all three dimensions. So here we have somebody who's selling jewelry and they're, they have a back, they have a back to their booth. This is in an indoor permanent space and yet they're not taking advantage of it. The vast majority of their product is just laying flat on the tables and of course as you're approaching the booth what do you also see is all the clutter of the blue totes and water bottles under the table so those those tablecloths ideally should be going down to the ground contrast that this is somebody in the right next door you can see the other vendor there just to the far left this person is next door and look at the job that he's done he's built his display taken advantage of the space at the back built some lovely display cases um, and also we'll touch on this later but look he's got a very friendly smile and he's standing up in his display things that we talked about last week in terms of customer service and how to put your own best foot forward as a vendor at a farmer's market it includes standing up Here's another example, lots of people who do preserved product or product in jars do a good job of building vertical displays. And so this is a good example of that. This is a permanent display of a bakery uh, vendor at the Moncton Farmers Market in New Brunswick. This was a non-market day. I was there doing a tour, but um, they've obviously uh, done a good job Deciding that their business was worth building infrastructure in order to capitalize on merchandising. 
This, you notice there's a little small heart. It's not quite the big blue heart. The reason for that is I, I like many of the things happening here. Um, I think the tablecloth is too busy. You, we're going to talk about tablecloths during this presentation, but really you need to be using solid color, one color tablecloth so that they don't distract, that they add to, you don't want them to be the focus themselves. You want them to be neutral so that your product is showcased. My biggest, um, what, the comment about this tent is that she's using a string across the front of her booth to hang some product. And you have to be very conscious of the fact that some people are taller or if the wind picks up, those could be flapping and could hit somebody in the head or in the eyes or something. So I like that she's hanging things from her tent, but those toques or hats need to be moved along to the side. You want to always leave the top of your booth open where customers are entering. I really like what she's done here with her paintings and artwork. She's built specific little wooden display racks that tilt her artwork up on an angle. So many of you who do art cards or photography are wondering how do I do a good job displaying that without having to use baskets that people are rifling through. So I think she's done a really great job here. Less can be more. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, this is a, this is, if you look at the sign at the back, it says cookies and sweaters for your dog, but it's very hard to know what's being sold at this booth. There's a lot of stuffed animals that I think are there for display, but this is a booth that needs to be stripped down just to the things that are being sold because there's so many stories about fundraisers and cutesy little animals that make it very hard to see what's for sale. Less would be much more in this case. I give a nice big heart to this one despite the fact that the vendor's sitting down. I wish that he was sitting on a high stool like we talked about last week rather than a chair. But look at all of the things that are happening here that work well at a farmer's market. The shelving is very portable and yet it's quite high. So it holds a lot of things up on that vertical height. I love that there's a welcome sign right at the beginning of the booth. Even if they don't sell any of those, they should keep making them because it's just so nice to be welcome into the booth with something that says welcome. Um, not everybody is into any particular product or aesthetic. That's not the point here. Maybe everybody isn't into this particular kind of product. But for the people who are, this is well displayed. You can make everything out. And there's a range of um, options for where to look. This is a booth that's suffering from too much display and not nearly enough product. You also notice the tablecloth is off center a little bit. It's worth paying attention and setting up your tablecloth so that it's even along the bottom. My suggestion for booths like this, what's happening here is the vendors trying to take advantage of their full booth. And so they're putting a table and a shelving unit and then some baskets. No, you will sell more by taking all that product and putting it on that little table in the middle and figuring out a nice way to merchandise it on a smaller space. Because it's hard to sell a few of anything, isn't it? Near the end of the market, you're down to just a few of this, that, and the other thing. And we all know that those are the hardest things to sell. Well, it looks when you have not enough product and a lot of display space, base. It looks like you don't have much to sell right from the beginning. So what you want to do is take the little amount that you do have and put it on a smaller size table. So at least that small table has some sense of abundance and a lot happening there. Ah, this is my one of my little fellows. He's now a 17 year old teenager, but here he is. You can just see the sign, the kids booth. One of the markets near here has a children's booth available for kids. And you notice he doesn't have much for sale. 
but because we put him onto a smaller table, we use big price signs and we put some plants at the back to give some vertical height, he actually has a nice inviting display. He has this picture of himself and his booth um, business name, Jason's Jams there in the back corner and, and he has a very likable, warm smile. So this is a booth that works not because there's a lot to sell, but because he's condensed it nicely and used big price signs to make it work. So this is, um, I give them a heart because I love the matching aprons. And I think more of us in the farmer's market sector could do more with our own personal branding. And I know you all have preferences about that and it's fine, but I think there's lots of people who do do something similar to what these two are doing. They have aprons or t-shirts that match and it really looks great in a farmer's market setting. So um, I hope more of you consider that kind of having your uniform for the market. This, <clears throat> so we have the same issue going on here, don't we? Which is there's not really enough product to sell a lot of product. On one of those cake trays, there's only seven cupcakes. They would be better off to be on that same smaller table like Jason was selling at in the last slide so that it looked like there was more abundance. The other thing I'd comment on here is they have a very small price sign, don't they? The font is very small. You have to be right up close in front in order to read what am I looking at and what's the price? Well, lots of people will be intimidated by that. They they don't want to get that close to the booth and the people and the product in order to find out what the price is. So this is an example of product that also would do very well to have its own price signs bigger in front of each individual tray of goodies. Because if you're reading the price sign, let's say it says, I don't know, I can't make it out, but let's say one of them is lemon meringue cupcakes and one is vanilla cupcakes you don't know which is which because the price signs here and the products here and it all kind of looks similar. So in a case like this, you want to have the actual name of the product and the price of the product on a sign right by the product rather than use one of these generic uh, price signs. That can work really well for produce and things where people know what is a carrot versus a Brussels sprout. But in a case like this, you'd want to be individually labeling things. My final comment is when you have two people at the booth, you can tell that they've come together um, for a picture, but you really want people to be on the opposite ends of the booth. So rather than having two people in the middle, you position yourselves one at either end. It kind of breaks that feeling for customers like it's a two, two against one feeling. People are more apt to approach your booth if you're not standing right beside another salesperson or vendor. All right, some of you might recognize this. So I was in BC at your um, Farmer's Market Conference in Duncan a few years ago, if you remember. So I have some pictures from the Duncan Farmer's Market in here. Henry and Jones grass-fed beef, love the sign. It's big, it's legible, and it's very clear what's for sale. From across the market, I could tell, ah, oh, there's grass-fed beef over there. Now, the heart could be a little bit bigger. This fellow here is sitting pretty comfortably with his pen. I hope he's not doing like a Sudoku puzzle or something. Um, so he needs to be up on a stool waiting for customers. Um, but otherwise, this is a great, effective display. Here's another example of too much display case and not enough product. Over here on the right, we even have a shelving unit. It's very heavy with wood, isn't it? The wood and the color of the wood distracts from the product, which is so small. You have to be careful not to have furniture pieces that are so heavy when you have very small product, because then it it just gets lost in the background of wood. And we also, here we have some little drawers. So the product isn't even available and accessible, it's tucked away in some drawers. So every product that's here, this vendor needs to get rid of that display case entirely, move the table into the middle of her 10 by 10 tent, and then um, 
do something different, probably paint that display case that's not so dark against her small white labeled product and get all of her products somehow displayed on a single table. That would improve this. Here's a good one, small but effective. Here's another good one. Why? Because they're using a much smaller table. So they don't actually have too much to sell here, but they've created a sense of abundance by using some different levels, by having the baskets sort of overflowing onto the table and using a little dining room table, which is a cute table to use in a farmer's market setting if you have a way to transport a table like that. Think about your lighting. So many of you use standard white or the standard brown, like tan colored tents, and they're great because you don't get these ghastly, really, this is a ghastly color hue, isn't it, onto the product. So this yellow tent is not doing this product any favors. It's kind of casting a yellow light onto all of the product below, and that's not an inviting color. Um, so when you're buying tents, be thinking what is, how reflective is that material, how much of it is going to have light pouring through it, and what kind of shadowing is going to come from that color. Here we have a display case at an indoor farmer's market, but that middle tier is so dark because there's only light at the top and the bottom. So you can see that people would have to be kind of tucked down and looking into that middle rack to see what's there. I think you need to just fix the lighting, add another layer of lighting, or push those price signs right to the very front because that's um, a cumbersome service counter. Here's another example of lighting. So in this case, they don't have a ton of light coming through. I'm not sure if they're against a building or what, but you can see the dark cement. And then what they've chosen to use is dark navy tablecloths and it doesn't pop the produce. Look at the back of the tent where the produce is get against the white at the back. Look at how much more vibrant that is. Imagine if all of those tablecloths were in a white or an off-white instead of the dark navy. What would that do? That would break the eye from seeing the cement kind of carry up through, which is what's happening when you have dark cement and dark tablecloths. So I really recommend produce vendors use lighter colors. You can use burlaps and some tans, ivories, whites. There's even... You'll see some examples of using wood, using um, different colors of plastic bins, but staying away from those dark colors because they just pull the light out of your produce. And what you want is to be using colors that really um, provide almost underneath lighting. Your bins and baskets, if you use them, they matter. So here's another example. I don't like black bins for produce, it's the, the, for the exact same reasons that we just saw with those tablecloths. It doesn't, it sucks the light out of your product. Look at how much those, the vegetables stand up against the price signs. Where the price signs are is where there's the most energy in that display. So if those bins were white instead of black, that whole display would have a much more um, you'd just be able to see the product shining much more readily. Here's an example of wood. Not In not every jurisdiction can you use wood anymore, but where you are allowed to use wood, look at how nice product or produce looks when you use wood. And a lot of things in glass jars and things also look nice against wood. So give wood a chance if you're in an, um, an area where the food safety regulations allow for you to use wood for displays. So uh, this gets an X because essentially what's happened is it's getting near the end of the day, I would assume, and this display is getting quite picked over. And what I see is a lot of white and not as much product. So this is the art of as your booth sells out, how do you keep managing your booth make the most of the product that you do have left? 
My suggestion in this case is everything on that bottom shelf should be moved up. So the top two shelves are fuller rather than looking somewhat empty and picked over. And what this vendor should do is have built some signs that they bring every week that just lay into that um, into the empty spaces. So in this case, it would be the bottom shelf. You'd have some signs that said sold out until next week or thanks for coming by or more cucumbers next week or have a great day at the farmer's market. Just some kind of visual, happy, welcoming message that you'd put there so that you're not facing this sea of just plain, boring, white, empty space because it's hard to sell when there isn't a sense of abundance. You need to keep working your display. This gets a nice big heart because these are French baguettes being displayed in the appropriate sized basket. These are the right height, they're the right shape. Your bins and baskets need to match your product. This gets a smaller heart, but still a heart. I think there's lots of um, great displays that can be made using baskets. In this case, they're plastic, but also there's wooden ones. The trick with these is once the product's down below like one third of the way down, you start getting shadowing and things start looking dark in there. And there's also that feeling of there's not as much left. So how vendors use these more efficiently or um, with more success, I'll say, is that you kind of fill the bottom half with some kind of stuffing. And you basically, you're just, then you replenish the tops of your baskets and really you're just selling off the top few inches and you keep putting fresh product there. That prevents people from ever be trying to find product down where it's darker in the bottom of an empty bin. Again, from the Duncan Farmer's Market, love this booth. I love the burlap, it matches the wooden boxes. I like that they took the time to paint some with some um, chalkboard paint an area on each box where they can write in what's for sale that day and what the price is. The only reason I've given it a slightly smaller heart is those blackboards don't look good. They need to be washed down and somebody needs to be paying more attention to the handwriting and things like they're getting rubbed away um, over the run of the morning by your customers. So this is again just managing your booth. They've done everything right but by the end of the day the booth is starting to look a little worn out and that for all of the effort that you've made to make a beautiful display, you don't want to give that feeling as your market day winds down. You want your booth to still look fresh 10 minutes to the end as it did 10 minutes to the beginning. Here's another example of somebody using wood in a permanent display. Now, obviously the clutter on the bottom needs to be dealt with. So that would be some drapery or even some custom doors or whatever. But I included this one because um, when you have permanent indoor spaces, there can be a tendency to create almost too boutique of a look for some of your product and to lose that rustic charm. But it turns out people really like the rustic look of much of what happens at farmers markets and people indicate they shop at farmers markets for an alternative to traditional retail so i want to encourage you when you do have indoor booths to be careful about overdoing it and to become too fancy or to become too boutique that takes the nature of why people like to shop at farmers markets out of it. So this is a great example with the wooden bins and some high shelving wooden shelves of keeping a really rustic vibe, even though they have a permanent space. And I think that looks really good. They just need to clean up the bottom. This is just a quick tip slide. You can see that they're using little 
There's quart and pint boxes. They've pre-put a plastic bag into those. And so if somebody says, I want that bin right up front, that one with the couple of, it looks like there's a couple of jalapenos and then some red peppers. They just slide the plastic bag up over the product and away they go. The vendor keeps the bushel, or not, it's not a bushel basket, the pint basket or the quart basket and can put another plastic one in. And this works well and it's efficient and it keeps hands off of product when you have little things to sell. You can see in the very back, there's some cayenne peppers here too. Um, that would work well for um, quite a few small product, small produce items that need to be bagged as you go along. Basically pre, a pre-bagged station. Here's an example of using bins. These are simply trays, wooden trays in this case, but what makes this work is that they're all the same. Whatever you choose, make sure it's uniform, make sure you're sticking with an overall theme and aesthetic. I've seen some terrible farmer's market displays and when I'm looking at the pictures, breaking it down, what it is is that all the individual components are nice, but it's the fact that there's too many components and it makes it look mismatched. So once you have an aesthetic and a feel and a set of trays or bins or baskets in this example, um, you want to use those throughout your display. Do I even need a bin or basket? And of course the examples, no. The answer is no. Um, produce vendors do a great job of just stacking. I, I presented this slide when I was doing a workshop for vendors in Truro, Nova Scotia last winter. And one of the vendors in the audience put up their hand and said, yeah, but you have to have so much product in order to make those stacks work. And another vendor put up their hand and said, you know, that isn't really true. If you look at it, we're looking at about seven bunches of Swiss chard. There's about 12 bunches of beets there. So it does look like a very full voluminous display, but it doesn't take that much product to make some of those nice stacks. So um, that could work. Here's a bread baker, things are open. We did have somebody write in a question before the webinar and it was about um, at her farmer's market for food safety reasons, her um, requirement was that her baking was behind some kind of barrier and baked goods don't look good behind plastic, what do you do? Really, there's no, there's no magic answer. You probably need to invest in sneeze guards that go up and then come across and a little bit on the side so you have a barrier and you're selling behind something that's much more of a porous see-through glass or plastic. Putting th stuff on top of your baked goods is much less effective than just creating a barrier. Here's another example of no bins or baskets, except they do. They have a few here and there, and I like how this can work, where most of your product is out of bins and baskets, but you, this in this case, they're using mostly wicker baskets. They have a couple of black plastic baskets just to hold certain things. Works really nicely. Notice also halfway up the table, they've added a, an entire tier of boxes and then run their table covering over both. It's navy blue, by the way. I'd love to see it in a brighter color. Um, but by doing it that way with bins across their entire table, look at how tall they're able to build their display. Um, this, is a, this is a winery, I think from BC. Please let me know if it is. Um, why I like this so much is because some, so the wine industry itself has a lot of information on selling at trade shows and things, but that boutique look doesn't always translate well into a farmer's market setting. Sometimes it does. I don't want to say there's a, a right or wrong. It's all based on your community, the location of your farmer's market, isn't it? But in this case, they've really just by adding those wooden elements, they've added a farmer's market feel to this wine display. They've also done something that's really important, I think, as a wine merchant at farmer's markets, is to keep multiple bottles out for display. There's some wineries who have a lot of wine, and so they put out one or two bottles of 20 or 30 different things. Very hard to sell that. 
much better to be alternating through your stock, having 10 or 12 wines per week that are the focal point of your display, several bottles of each of them. It doesn't mean you don't have a brochure listing all of them, or maybe you have a case for the real wine connoisseurs who come that you want to talk to about the additional wines that you have. But for the average person walking around at a farmer's market, 20 or 30 wines on display, a few of each bottle, it's not effective. People don't like that much choice. It's too hard to make choices that way. So this is a really nice compromise. Small heart here because they're missing that tablecloth. It's really important to break the feeling between concrete, dirty cements, parking lots and food and table covers do a really good job of that. But I love the cornucopia. This works really well. They're using those bushel baskets in a way that works for them. Tablecloths matter. So <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, the mom and me, you know, I just feel like going over to that little boy and, you know, grabbing his cheek and saying, oh, my God, you're so cute because he has those skinny little boy ankles. And we all have seen those. But that's the first thing I see whenever I see this is those cute, skinny little ankles. Well, there's a whole table of stuff there, but it's almost lost. You see so much of the concrete and the legs of the tables and the legs of the vendors. And then you see all behind them, all the vehicles and stuff. Their product exists within just such a small vertical dimension that it almost gets lost. In this case, having a barrier down to the ground would just move your eye up to the top of the table so much more effectively in order to see what's for sale there. <clears throat> this is that same vendor in New York City. Um, you can see what a good job they've done. The branding of the table cloths would work in my mind if those were the only places that the signs were because then as soon as you have people standing in front of your signs, what happens? Nobody else can see it. It works here because from far away when there aren't people, it looks great, but they've also replicated their signage at the top of their tent and behind the vendors. So there's lots of places for people to see the, the name of their business. Here's another example. They've even gone so far as to put a tilt table and it looks great. But again, notice how easy it is not to see the product because you see so much of the focus is on those table legs and all of what's happening under the table. If you drop down some tablecloths, it moves your eye up to the product. I said I don't like dark tablecloths. And this slide I throw in here as an example of everything. There's an exception to every rule. There are no rules, really. In a case like this, the dark tablecloth, then with a very light colored sheepskin, or I think it's not a sheepskin. It's a piece of leather, um, not rawhide, tanned leather. Um, against her leather products, it really works. It fits so well with her product that for her the dark tablecloths are way better than it would be if she was trying to use white. So really the dark tablecloths against produce in particular, you need to um, use what works against whatever product you're selling. I also like that she's using um, a vase of flowers there that adds such a nice fresh look to her table. And she's standing nicely. And look at, she has her sign very high up behind her so that people can see from across the market that she has handcrafted bison leather journals. <clears throat> I said earlier, in terms of tablecloths, printed tablecloths, and eh, you really want to stick with neutral table covers so that what's on display is your product. And you're not just cluttering people's visual field with more information from the tablecloth. The only except, but there's an exception to that too. Look, they have a tablecloth with all these little tomatoes on it, and this is a pesto pizza with mozzarella cheese stand. 
in a case like this, I almost think you could get away with that tablecloth because it matches perfectly and adds to the sense of the product. So again, I'm reminding you that there's no hard and fast rules. There's some best practices and then you adapt them based on what you're selling. <laughs> so this is one of my favorites too. This is the, you know, it has that feeling like I rolled out of bed on Saturday morning, grabbed my bed sheets and off I went to the market and then put those same bed sheets on my tables. They don't look good. You can tell sheets versus tablecloths because they have, you know, the sheet thing at the top the, where it's folded over. These are wrinkled. They, they Sheets don't hold up very well to being packed and repacked because they wrinkle well. They're put on without attention to whether they're level. So um, in lots of ways, the, um, before you even see the product, you're seeing a lot of wrinkly sheets. And I don't think it's the look that you're going for. <clears throat> Lots here to appreciate. I'm slightly smaller heart because I wish these were dropped to the ground. There is a lot of stuff that they're storing under their tables that would be good to have out of sight. But look at what a nice job they did of making sure their tablecloth is nice and straight edged across the whole vertical. And then look, they have baskets, but where they don't have baskets and they have bunches, they have these matching pieces of burlap, burlap cloth, or it might be like a linen or an unbleached cotton. It's consistent. The whole booth is consistent. So when you look at it, you have a sense that it's, it's organized, it's tidy, it's clean, um, works very effectively. This is the opposite, there's no table color covering. You're selling produce off of like plywood. I don't like plywood, I think it off gases, and so I'm not sure that I'd be keen on buying Swiss chard that's been laying on open plywood. Now, they're selling stuff. I'm not saying nobody will buy from them, but I think in all the cases where there's an X, I'm simply making the point that there's things that vendors can do to increase their sales, and that's how you can help grow your business. In this case, for me particularly, they're against a road, and so there's vehicles parked there, potentially exhaust fumes, and so if you had a tablecloth, it would just break for everybody that sense, ah, now we're in a, there's a, a uh, something holding back the exhaust. This is, if you're against a busy street, you can make a real strong argument that having a tarp from the top of your tent down to the ground is also a really good um, part of your merchandising just to get the street noise and fumes out of your tent, out of your booth space. This one's back in here just to show the tablecloths are tablecloths if they if you've got breeze, you know that tablecloths can actually be a pain. They can knock things off your table and stuff. So these are banquet tablecloths. You can go online. You can work with local seamstresses. That's what I did to have banquet tablecloths made. They more drop on top of your table because they're sewn tight. Um, and so you get a nice seamless look that stands up to lots of wind and wear. Notice they've also taken the time to sew patches of color that match their farm logo and color scheme onto those table coverings. This is an, you know, a good example of adding some extra effort to that P part of the principle. You spend 80, 90% of your time focused on your P product. Well, then I'm going to tell you there's opportunities lost for you to be building your business by focusing on your presentation as well as you, your own personal skills and the person you show up 
as, as a marketer at farmers markets. You need to pay attention to those other two Ps as well. And this is an example of doing that. Here's another one that I love. And you might say, oh, not everybody's into this look. Well, there's a great saying. It's that the riches are in the niches. This is somebody who has embraced their aesthetic and taken it to all the way to the end. Every single person who is into this kind of pastel country themed look will love this booth. They'll go right on over. Everything from the little rug to the, there's fabric pieces that are running across her table coverings. It all matches. It's a very tidy, seamless look. Um, and this is, this is exactly what all of you want to be trying to achieve, which is who am I, what am I about, and how does my booth help represent that to the world? Can they read it? Euro Farm, you're in BC, so I hope um, this is okay. This gets an X partly because there's, there's so much for sale here, you probably need two whiteboard signs so that you can print bigger. It's getting to be just too small to try to cram it all onto one. The other thing I'm pointing out here is a number of things are being sold by the pound. Apples, zucchini, fava beans, rhubarb. There are some exceptions. A few people like buying things by the pound so you can have poundage signage with the product. But by and large, Vendors should be focusing on selling by the each, by the bunch, by the unit. So it's apples per container. It's zucchini by the number. It's fava beans by the bag. Even if it's $3 a pound, you can have $3 per pound. And then what you do is you have several bags of favas already pre-weighed out with a $3 one pound three dollars on the bag so people know what they're getting for three dollars because that's this is part of that customer service piece is is people don't know garlic two dollars a pound what am i getting for two dollars and people are reluctant to ask we heard that very clearly with the survey information and then with some of the quotes that i shared near the end of the webinar you want customers to know the price of things without having to talk to you about it. And so pricing things by the each and by the bunch is a way to do that for customers. This is a small sign, a small heart. It could be bigger. What I love is that they've, I like the font that they use when they um, painted their farm name onto this sign, but it's, you need to go home every week and wash your blackboards. You need to put a damp cloth on it because it's so hard to read chalk that's gone on top of a dirty chalkboard. It just starts looking sloppy. It's getting hard to read. There's so much to like about this sign and the handwriting of this vendor that if it was written onto a clean chalkboard, it would just make all the difference. This is something that's really quite neat. This bakery, Flower to the People, is using big empty bags that their wheat and flour come in to make the signs for their pizza dough and focaccia and stuff. So that's a nice example of using some component of the inner workings of your business to showcase and celebrate what you're selling. And look, they have little sold out signs. So as things sell, they don't cover it. And it they they kind of put sold out so people know, ah, oh, next week I could get pizza dough here. I could get a French loaf here. So that's a nice way of communicating to customers and letting them know what they'll get next time. Rather than just what most of us do, what many vendors do when it's sold out, it's out of sight. You don't know that it's available next week. So using sold out signs is a really great strategy. This gets a heart. It's kind of simple, kind of bare bones, but the printing is nice and big. They've only got five things on this sign. So they're printing 
you know, nothing's lost here. They're using multiple signs around their booth rather than trying to cram everything onto one price sign, and it works well. This is another example of rhubarb. $2 a pound, but it's bunched. And so it should just say either, so it says $2 a pound, three pounds for $5. What are those bunches that I'm seeing? Is that a $2 bunch or is that a $5 bunch? Um, there's just so much room for an easy fix here so that customers really know what are they looking at when they're looking at that bunch of rhubarb? What is the price of that? Just clean, clean that up for the customer. Put a label on it, that can do a lot. So here's an example of farmer's market booth and what happens when you put the price of things down below the top of your table. It looks great now, but as soon as somebody's standing in front of one of those signs, like if somebody's standing in front of fresh peas, $5 bag, then nobody else is gonna know the price of the fresh peas. So really, you want to be elevating your price signs. <clears throat> Here's an example of something that I really think more of us could be doing at farmer's markets, whether we sell produce or other things. This isn't just carrots at $4 a bunch. Excuse me. They have multiple kinds of carrots. In this case, it's Nantes Coralist carrots that are sweet and tasty. But that might be beside another kind of carrot that is good for winter storage or another kind that is tender for raw eating. And so you're giving customers not just the name of the product, but the varietal name, because there's a small but growing number of people who shop at farmer's markets who have a lot of food knowledge, a lot of gardeners shop at farmer's markets and appreciate varietal names. And then you're telling them what does that variety what is the features and benefits, as we talked about last week, of buying a Nantes Corliss carrot versus some other carrot, some other generic carrot. So this is really um, great, thoughtful merchandising. Here's an example of cookies. You sell them by the each. You probably won't sell six, but you put them in a nice bag, piece of ribbon, and it's much easier to sell multiples if that's the business you want to have. This is a great idea, the Greek salad pack. So in here we've got cucumber and bell peppers. There's onion, tomato, piece of garlic, and it says Greek salad pack. So when I see that as a potential customer, I don't think, oh, instead of buying cucumbers and peppers and tomatoes individually, I'll just buy this. No, I think I'm still going to buy all of those things individually, but I'm also Ah, I can also make a Greek salad this week because that's so easy. This is the kind of putting a label on it that just added an idea to my mind, and I'm going to add this to my list. It's not going to replace anything on my list. You can do this with pesto packs and all. You just use your creativity, a quinoa salad pack, whatever it is. So, oh. I should probably change this X to an X and a heart because I love mushrooms. I love how they've got them neat and tidy on this table. But here's the problem is nobody's going to know how many oyster mushrooms are they going to get for $6.99, how many white button mushrooms for $2.89. Selling by the pound, especially something like mushrooms where you're going to encourage people to buy some mushrooms they're not as familiar with. The the best strategy I think you could use to transform this very quickly is to take those bags that are laying out front and to pre-bag and to keep a set of pre-bagged bags in front of each basket so they're all pre-weighed out and you've written with a marker or pen, whatever, white mushrooms, um, $3, white mushroom, $5. You could do that with all of them. Give bags that are pre-weighed out at a couple of different pipe price points, you still have the baskets out there to show people what the mushrooms look like. If this is faster, people don't have to touch the mushrooms, they don't have to see other people touching mushrooms that they might be buying, and it tells them right away, oh great, I can spend 
four dollars for cremini's and look i can get some uh, portobello's and that's going to cost me another six dollars um just make all of that math and all of those purchasing decisions easier for your customers here's somebody who just had their carrots and they put the name gourmet on it and suddenly instead of a four dollar bunch it's a five dollar bag that's can be the power of a label Here's somebody at the um, Dieppe Farmer's Market in New Brunswick. These are tomato transplants. And many of our seed growers selling in the farmer's market sector have gotten good at providing visuals so people know what the, pro the end result is when they grow this kind of tomato, you're gonna get this kind of tomato. But with transplants, for whatever reason, not not everybody is providing visuals. So these are pictures of the tomatoes laminated and stuck with the transplants. It just makes that whole display look so visual and it is so compelling to want to have a little of this and a little of that and a little of that in my garden. And suddenly you've got somebody who's going to go crazy planting 12 tomatoes in their back deck. Um, rather than one or two, which they might have bought. You see that all those tomatoes look so similar without the, and you may say, well, I have the name tags with them. I'm just saying provide that visual picture of the end product for those of you selling transplants. It's a great step. Lots to love about this display. I like her baskets. I like that the shape allows her to prop them up on each other and create this nice tier. She has big bags of product, but she has nice big labels so on it. She has cooking ideas and a list of what they are and how to store it and how to wash it. And she's standing up and nice and friendly. Um, so many things are working well with this booth. I think these kind of wooden racks work well with lots of plants and flowers, in this case, herbs. It's another example of green and wood work well together. The one thing I'll say is for those of you who are selling with these kind of shelving units, that bottom level, they have it labeled, but I would hope that everything that's down there is also somewhere else up on the display because you're going to sell a lot less of the things down below just by the nature of how inconvenient it is down there. <clears throat> This isn't exactly a label, but it's an example of adding just something to a basic product. It elevates it. It makes it a little special. It makes it um, potentially more user friendly to take home because the sage is there and it's more you can have a little go as far as to handwrite in culinary sage on that. Um, I was mentioning seed producers putting pictures of the product on their seed packets at farmers markets and this is an example of somebody who's doing that looking good. Um, here's the wine vendor, the wine vendor with the purple scarf. Um, you know, I don't love the red color of the plastic that they're using. It's like a cherry red and I don't think it fits nicely with the dark reds that we associate with wines but there's some besides that that's just a personal preference from a merchandising perspective so much here is working well I like how they have the big boxes of wine on the end in a bit of a tier it kind of says this is the end of my booth it kind of marks it off they have laminated sheets on the table which says the name of the wine, something about the wine, like whether it's full bodied or medium or dry, maybe where it's grown or processed. I can't read those signs, but there's lots of opportunity on those signs to be giving information. I love that they're giving samples in real wine glasses. You can see that here in the middle in front of the customer. Um, if you're going to be doing samples of wines, it's just so elegant to use real wine glasses and then take them back to a kitchen to be cleaned every week. Um, and again, they're doing what I had suggested um, with the other 
wine winery picture that I showed, which is there's multiple bottles. So you can see that they have lots of different kinds of wine, but rather than showcasing 20, they're showcasing five or eight and having lots of each kind in front. That's an effective way to sell at farmer's markets because we know that big bunches of things work well at farmer's market settings. Your booth signage certainly matters. See, see what happens as soon as there's a customer in front of your tent, for all of you who are hanging your sign in front of your booth, then nobody else can read what's happening. I'll also point out as an aside with this picture, you can see there's a bunch of rhubarb and I think beet greens, but um, either they're filling in their booth at the beginning or they're, they've sold something out and all of that needs to be moved forward into the front of their booth because it's sitting off in the back and there's a lot of empty space there. From Grindrod, my favorite thing about this, besides those nice, cheerful faces, is that the day this, I feel like I could walk over and say, hi, Doug. Having your first name there on your sign is just so friendly. It's a great merchandising idea. Um, if I was to develop a farm sign again, after having discovered this picture, I would put my first name on it. It's a great tip. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> this I just throw in here for fun because it's so funny. It says food you can trust, but it's hanging off of a wagon made of astroturf. I don't know. It's just the most bizarre farmer's market find. Here we have somebody sell, selling sweet peas but she calls it the smell station. Just inhale, stop and smell the sweet peas. This is a reminder to us that we shop, think, process, make decisions using all of our senses. The sense of smell is a very primal, important sense. And she's just encouraging all of her customers to stop and smell. And so there's something about her merchandising, not just the product, but the experience. It's really lovely. She's calling it her greens soul food the other thing i'll point out here is the apple juice tins you you may think well you know gosh the farmers market sector is evolving we need to keep up with trends we can't be using empty apple juice containers for our flowers anymore well if she had apple juice tins mixed in with other things, I'd say you're right. But the apple juice tins is all she's using. These big rows of flowers and apple juice cans. And the silver is actually very shiny and bright. And I think it works really well. Again, it's about the consistency using the same materials in your display then you can use something rustic and fun. And in this case, fits very well with her flowers, those apple juice tins. Here's some vendors who are busted doing some of the things we talked about last week. Okay, so <laughs> a few things here. This tablecloth may belong on somebody's grandmother's or great aunt's table but it does not belong on your farmer's market table it's not the right color it's not the right shape so there's that basically these three look like they're at the end of a long day don't they they don't have much left but they don't they don't have much left <laughs> their product themselves so they're weary and tired and it looks it they've rubbed out with their fingers some stuff that's sold off of their signs rather than putting sold out they've just rubbed them off so it doesn't give me as a customer an opportunity to know what they would have next time they've got clutter under their booth they unfortunately have the teenager so i have some teenagers so i can say this lovingly when you have teenagers who've kind of lost it at the end of the day they shouldn't be sitting behind your booth you got to Tell the teenagers to go find a spot to sit somewhere else. They need to stand up. One of the things that I say to vendors and vendor training is this is your day to shine. You've worked all week to be here. 
you can't you need to be alert and bright to the person who comes one minute after the market closes just the same as you were to the person who came one minute before market started you be up you be on your feet ready to greet them tell them about your farm say your good mornings <clears throat> i had a I sold at markets for 18 years and for a number of those years I was at one market and I was next to another vendor and I can probably still tell you to this day his little spiel because he told it to everybody who came every week year after year. I was so tired of hearing it but he was a great example of how you don't assume that people know that you give the same customer at the beginning of the market as you do the end of the market. You give them the same level of customer service. You give them the same information about your farm week in and week out. And so these, uh, these people are just an opportunity for me to remind you that the end of the market can't be an opportunity to just look like you're wiped out because you're gonna take home all of that product. They might as well have a big closed sign up because everything about their body language and the fact that they haven't tidied up their booth tells us all that they've checked out. Here's somebody who's sitting and reading a book, a couple of the worst things to do at a market. We talked about that last week. Here's somebody who's obviously so delighted and happy to be here selling some of her artwork and stuff that her mom's made. Remember I was talking last week about um, being conscious of people's personal bubble and personal space. And so um, this is an opportunity to show what it can mean to have your hands tucked behind. You can still be look very friendly and warm. There isn't always a feeling of, oh, I've got a, something behind my back that's not good. Um, and it helps just minimize how much space people need around them in busy places like a farmer's market. This booth really needs a lot of work. It looks to me like the person in the pink chair has designed a booth for her to look at rather than for her customers to look at. So she's gonna sit in that very deep chair. Those ones are hard to get out of. You know, excuse me while I painstakingly raise myself out of my deep lawn chair to serve you. You don't want that. That lawn chair looks like everything she can see well from there. That table needs to be turned out to the front and be across the front of it. It looks like her handbag is maybe hanging there at the front. That doesn't look like it's part of the display because there's no signage or tag. There's been an attempt to have some decorative items, but those very sheer pieces of um, what would you call that? fabric that she's using at the back as soon as there's any breeze that's going to blow it's going to hit product potentially hit people so that's probably not the right kind of fabric to be using to create farmers market booths so this needs to be all reworked and pushed out front the chocolate doctors are sitting down and they're sitting down together in the middle it's the worst combination. People who come together need to be sitting on, or not sitting, forget I said that, standing or up on their stools at the opposite ends of their farmer's market booth or table. So there isn't sort of a barrier of two people for prospective customers to deal with. And we don't have time today, but maybe in a subsequent webinar, we can talk about how to use the actual square footage of your table to the best advantage. But I will say that this space right up front where the chocolate doctor sign is, is one of your prime selling spaces in your booth, whether your booth is an eight, a 10 by 10 foot tent space, or it's the top of a six foot by three foot table, that space right there is prime selling space your signs shouldn't be there. Product needs to be there. Those signs should be up near the back in the less productive sales areas. Some of their the things that they make their best profit margins on should be up front and center. Much more to say about that, but that's a topic for another time. 
similar products at different price points. And why is that? Simply because they've merchandised them differently. So the product is the same, the merchandising is different, and so the price points can change. So here we have somebody selling um, beautiful homemade chocolates or truffles or something at a farmer's market. You can tell when you really look, there's a lot of intricate work there. Now, a couple things to say. One, the tablecloth isn't helping. I love her smile and her hat, Santa hat. In terms of the branded sweatshirt, I think you need to be very careful about not wearing other brands and branded clothing when you're representing yourself at farmer's markets. Um, but mostly what I want to say is her product is just sitting there in plastic on a table. That Those chocolates or truffles merchandised differently could probably double in price, similar to these other two vendors. So this vendor in the top left is at the Halifax Seaport Farmer's Market. Those chocolates are two and a half times the price of the ones on the previous slide. And look, they're much simpler. They just have sea salt on the top. The shape isn't nearly as consistent. Her price point is very different because of how she's merchandising. Same with the others. This is a picture from Sydney, Australia. This is a picture off online, but this is chocolates in bags. Again, very different price points. Here we have the jam and crocheted slipper vendor. I think every farmer's market almost everywhere has one of these. The price points will be what they will be, which are quite low, versus this person who's done more in terms of the merchandising and her labels and the look and feel of her booth. Now, those two people may have the same you know, dilly bean pickles, they may have the same strawberry rhubarb jam, they may have the same skill set in terms of making product. But this vendor is going to be charging and getting much more than the vendor in the first slide simply because of the difference in how she's presenting. Your brand and your product matter more than your name. This is one that I hope you really pay attention to here. This is again from the Duncan Farmer's Market. I apologize for the picture, it's a terrible picture. What it is showing is that the, this sign says, flour, water, and 18 hours, slow bread. That's all it says. That's their production. It's almost saying, here's what we are, here's what we aren't. There's no name of a company. This is how we do what we do. That's the key information. I don't care what the name of your bakery is. The benefit and the results to me as the customer is all about those few words they've put there. Here we have the happy camel. And it doesn't say the happy camel. Because if it did, it would be not very effective. But it says the happy camel's award-winning hummus and pita. Suddenly, I'm very interested in going over to that orange and white tent. So it's the happy camel. You don't even really need that part. If it just said award winning hummus and pita, you'd have customers. It's not true the other way around, is it? If you just had the happy camel, it's not nearly as effective. What you're selling is the key. Here's face of the earth. What's face of the earth? I don't know if it's the farm name or the philosophy of the farm or what, but there's this little box of hand-grown seeds, this one tiny little spot to say something to your customers, and what they've chosen to say is face of the earth. What it needs to say up there is local seed, $4, or locally grown or locally adapted seed or whatever, or handmade seed or seeds from... Kamloops or whatever it is you're going to say. So that's a really wasted opportunity. That little laugh, that little space needs to say something about the product, not the name of your business. Another farmer's market vendor in Duncan, Kilrenny Farm, their name is up there. But what you see across the market and what is important is their fresh artisanal pasta and pasta sauces. That's the key piece of information, and that's what they're showcasing on their sign. Marie and Guy's French Bakery, traditional breads and pastries. This works because 
the name of their business is what they do. Marie and Guy's French Bakery is their name, but it also tells us everything we need to know about their business. So in that case, their name and their business um, sort of tagline are one and the same. It has a slightly smaller heart because this sign, like many of your signs, are is starting to look a little worn. There's nothing like going <laughs> to a business and they're, you know, lettering on their signage is all peeling off and stuff. Well, the same happens to a lot of farmers market display signs because they're schlepped back and forth every week, every week, year in, year out. So refresh your signs, people. She's got it right, yoga and massage. Her name's on there, but she's not focused on that. The focus of her sign is what her service is. Now, the heart is slightly smaller because, again, I'd love to see that up behind her booth or maybe on the side back corner of her booth rather than down in front. But she is certainly focused on what the service is, not her name. And that's the point here. Great samples. We're almost at the end. So here we have somebody who has a bloody product, a bloody looking product, and it doesn't look good when it's like this. So if you look behind it, they actually have some beautiful product there. The labels are nice, the product is nice, but those samples are a mess. They're kind of falling out of the dishes. They're using toothpicks as the thing that people can use, but they're, they're runny. It's like a runny product, so toothpick doesn't work. They've left this tray of, I'm going to assume it's a beet relish or something, but it just looks unclean. And especially things that are red like blood, I think you have to be particularly careful about. So their sampling needs to get cleaned up here. Many of you would say, well, we can't do meat um, samples on charcuterie boards, and that may be true, unfortunately. But here I'm showcasing also these little tags, just the way you can do things that are slightly different or unusual to add something different, some different elements. So these shipping tags with the piece of cotton look really great. Melons, many of you know, certain product, you just you're not going to sell it by look alone or price alone. Sell it because it tastes great and let people try that. This is a good example of an apple cider vendor who has a sample station down low for the kids because lots of people buy apple cider as an alternative to juice for their kids. And so it really makes sense that this is a sample station for kids. And I'm going to tell you, I have... Um, we're a foster family right now. We have six children who live with us. Have done. We've been a family of eight for a long time now. They're longtime foster kids. I've spent, I swear, half my dis, but uh, what do I call that discretionary income buying treats for my kids at farmers markets because we go to markets together and they have lots of things that they love to have. And so farmers market vendors are smart who are giving samples and stuff to my kids because who am I to not um, treat them? Here's an example of a generous, um, a generous sample. It's a little cup of salsa and several so, um, chips. It's the opposite of like the toothpick of the runny pickles. Here's your sample. It's something to take away. There's a sense of generosity here. Now, forget about the food safety. You probably have to have those covered in domes. I'm not, um, don't lose the lesson behind some of these slides. If it doesn't exactly fit with what you're allowed to do, the samples could still work. And the idea here is just a generous sample. If you can afford it, if it's part of how you're going to merchandise, certainly leaves people with a nice impression. And even if they don't buy that day, there will be a sense of that salsa snack that I had partway through the market day was part of my market experience. And I bet over time, this is a very good strategy for building customers into this business. 
I like it when you have time and personnel to actually hand people sample plates so that you have a moment, an opportunity to say something about the product or how to use it or what it is rather than self-serve samples. Some of you are too busy and you have to do self-serve, but whenever you have the option to personally hand samples versus self-serve, always do the personal handing. There we go. So we talked about the big picture, what happens when people are seeing your market from across the market, working with all three dimensions, so getting some of your product up on to higher display cases and units within your booth. Less can be more. Consider your lighting. Don't let that be an afterthought. Your bins and baskets matter, but you also don't need a bin or basket. Your tablecloths really do matter. They do so many things to help um, visually, especially from far away. Make sure people can read your signs and that they stay legible and that you're managing your booth throughout the market. Put a label on it with and when it needs it. Your booth sign in matters. Busted. Don't be sitting. Don't be letting your booth get cluttered and disorganized and worn looking as the day moves along. You can sell the same product as somebody else, but you can get a different price point for it if your merchandising is different. When you're thinking signs, be thinking what, what are the results and the benefits? What am I really offering? Your name is secondary. You want, to, if you're selling produce, if you're selling pickles, if you're selling handmade goat's milk soap, you want people to remember that much more than your name. And if you're going to do samples, think about how to do a great job. So that's it for me for today. I want to take a minute before we do. Um, we have just a few minutes here for questions and answers, but we also agreed we would go an extra five or ten minutes if there are people who want to weigh in on and ask any questions or make any comments from your own lessons. I do want to just Thank BCAFM so much for having me back doing a project with them this winter. I'm not able to be at the conference this year, so this is just a great way for me to connect with you and stay connected to the farmers markets in BC. So I'm thrilled. Thanks to Anise and Georgia, who've both worked with me in the back, in the back to bring this to you. And don't forget that next week you have a great social media marketer coming to do some social media for vendor training. Um, there's my website. There's my email. And Georgia, why don't you um, invite people to um, type their questions into the question box in their control panel and I'll do my best to answer them. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, thanks for all those wonderful images. I love seeing the little X's and hearts. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've had some great questions coming through. Um, one of them was around having, um, this person has four small businesses, including yoga, Reiki, as well as photography, so a combination of services as well as products. Do you have any tips for combining those together well? So this that's a hard one because I actually, as much as possible, I don't think mixing's good, but I've seen it done, and you almost need to think about it as a retail shop, like you're renting out spaces on your table to four different businesses. And so they wouldn't be necessarily mixing their stuff together. So I think you need to help customers really understand what they're looking at by differentiating as much as possible. Maybe the photography is in the middle and the services are on the end and you just really try to create some distinct areas within your booth. Um, what else? This is almost where I also say it'd be so great if other people typed in their answers. Um, I also think the other thing to do is sometimes you can't do everything at the market and you really you choose. Am I going to sell my photography? Am I going to hand out? So one thing to do is maybe you focus on the product that you're selling, but you have customer newsletter sign up sheet with a big clear sign that says, um, interested or curious about Reiki or um, something about wellness or whatever, 
um, please sign up for an e our email newsletter about that. And then after market every single day, you send the people who signed up information about your yoga and Reiki. We happen at the market, but you have you're soliciting the emails there or something. Um, those are my off the top of my head thoughts. Great, thank you. And um, we had another question. So, in some of the images you showed, um, produce that didn't that weren't that wasn't in bins. Um, and how that could still be done well. We had a question about how do you advertise prices that are both close to veggies but um, not on bins? And you also mm -hmm. mentioned further along that it's not a good idea to put signage below the veggies. So any mm -hmm. tips around that? Right. So in those cases, this is where you have chalkboards or whiteboards that are hanging or mounted on sort of the corners of your table. So um, the signage information would be behind the product, above the product, and it would be, that's where you're going to have your Swiss chard and, by the bunch and beets by the bunch and carrots by the bunch all on those single signs. And depending on how big your booth is, you may have multiple signs with the same information on it. But that's really the only way to do that. The other thing that you can do is you can have a couple of bunches that have um, those shipping tags. And it says, you know, fresh beets $4 a bunch. And you just have a couple of your bunches labeled. Here's the problem is people will always want to buy those labeled ones. It's the funniest thing. So it really looks nice on a display to have those individual tags on a few of the products to help give price information but you'll constantly be managing um, this thing that people will pick those ones up so you'd have to work that out whether you want to the hassle of that or not great thank you and we have another question um which i'm assuming is about meat it may not be because meat, uh, we're only allowed to sell meat frozen in BC, pretty okay. much. Um, but this is, do you have a recommendation for how your booth should be set up when your product is frozen and kept behind the booth in coolers? We have a crock pot on the table to demo product and have made a demo container so customers can see what they look like, but the table is pretty much empty other than signage, crock pot, cash, cash box. Mm. Right. Well, um, I've seen some really nice <clears throat> ideas around the meat containers. So um, there are coolers that are not deep, like a traditional cooler. I don't know if you can see in my webcam or not. I can't see my webcam, by the way. So I'm hoping that everything I'm doing here is um, making sense. But they're, they're coolers that are n not as deep. And that instead of the lids, people have used plexiglass and created their own lids. So there's actually stuff in there that's frozen, but people can see in them. And there are coolers that aren't as deep, so they don't sit too high on a table, because a regular cooler, by the time it's up on a table, can be hard to see in. So I've seen that, and then what people are looking at are the wrapped packages of meat, and they're kind of laid out nicely with the labels facing the right way. That makes a nice display. Another thing is to have like an L shape or a T shape table. So in, so if we had, if your table's here and you have another table in the middle, but it's in the back where you are, and you have stacks of coolers up there, then you just put nice pictures of your farm and your animals and, and things right on the coolers. So they're not up front. Up front, you've got your signs and your crock pot and stuff, but people are getting a sense of the farm from your coolers. Those are the things that I've seen work particularly well with meat. Um, and again, it would be so great to have an interactive opportunity for other people to say things that they've seen work, but those are a couple of ideas. Thank you. 
We also had a question about um, favorite materials you would recommend for tablecloths. Right. Well, the ones that will swing the least in the wind are just those heavy, like heavy polyester cotton blends, but but you but almost in more of a denim weight. And you can buy fabric by the weight. But if you go online, you don't have to buy them online, but you can research them online. Go online and type in um, banquet. I think it's banquet tablecloths. Banquet tablecloths. They come standard in the industry. If you go to trade shows and stuff, all of or certain catered events where they have the tablecloth and then they have the piece that wraps around the front and sticks on the Velcro, that's all a certain weight of fabric and it's standard in the industry. It's that weight and that fabric that you want to use. So you could find that information online and then either make it yourself or order it online or, or get a local seamstress to make it. But go with heavy. It's it's a heavy, durable fabric that you want to be using. And one question regarding um, signage. So something that's easier to clean than blackboards that still gives the blackboard look. Hmm. <laughs> um. I don't know what to say. I don't know if there's an alternative, but in the back of my mind somewhere is that somebody told me about a product. They put up their hand at a farmer's market training. It might have been just this past winter when I was in Kimberly or, or in the fall. Um, and s there is some product that they bought at the hardware store that, ah, right. And it doesn't use chalk. It uses a kind of marker, but it's black like a chalkboard. So there are some alternatives. And again, I think that's going to a big hardware store and asking. Sorry, I don't have better information about that. No, I think that's great. That's perfect. Um, another question about accessibility which is any tips for making booths accessible to strollers, wheelchairs, elderly, or short people? If you have a 10 by foot by 10 foot space, it's this whole idea of will I have my tables up front or will I have more of a U shape and invite people in? I used to have that kind of booth because I had a big enough display and I needed all the space, but I also had a stool for customers. And I'll tell you, many seniors, but also many people with kids, would come and use the stool just as a place to take a break at the market. And I loved it because I, you know, enjoy talking to people and stuff. So maybe little things like that are possible for you when you're thinking about accessibility. That wouldn't necessarily deal with people in wheelchairs, but it would certainly help make the market more accessible to people who have maybe challenges with mobility or need more spaces to sit and rest. And also when you're thinking about accessibility, think about your printed material. I talked last week about having the story of your farm on your business cards and stuff. Well, that isn't very accessible for people who have reading challenges. So you might, you know, when you start thinking about accessibility and having an accessible business, it really, there's lots of areas that we could all improve. And so it's not just around mobility. Um, so just encouraging you to think all of us more broadly about accessibility because um, it is a big, it has many multiple components to it. Yeah, that's something that we've been thinking about more at the BCFM as well and trying to offer and develop some resources for markets on that. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, yeah, this so, is where the sector and markets as a whole and stuff really need to be addressing some of this because at a vendor to vendor to vendor level, we'd be able to do so little. But at the market level and at the provincial association level, we could do much more. Yeah, so I think it's we're at um, 11 minutes past 12. Um, so 
If we didn't get to answer your question today, please do send an email to michelle at michelle at wholegreenheart.com or you can email us at the BCFM too. Me or Anise will do our best to answer your question or direct you to resources and you can email us at info at bcfarmersmarket.org. Um, and just a reminder, we will be sending you the, uh, the recording of the webinar. Um, definitely feel free to share it uh, if you found it helpful. And we do have the final webinar in the series coming up next Tuesday, uh, February 19th from 10.30 to 12 Pacific Standard Time. And that'll be looking at best practices in social media for farmers markets and vendors working together to leverage your online presence with social media consultant and trainer Rebecca Coleman. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much, Michelle. So it's a pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Hope everyone has a good rest of your day and you enjoy the snow, if there is snow around you. We have a lot of snow in the lower mainland. But take care and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.